because I live, you will live also, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the first things are passed away. We sing to the glory of God the Him. Praise to the Lord the Almighty, numbered 28. Kindly be seated. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we turn to you in the sorrow and grief of our bereavement, praying that we may find the strength we need in your sustaining grace, so that even as we mourn the death of one whom we knew and loved, we may not be overcome by this trial but we may hold fast trusting in your goodness and mercy. Assure us, O Lord our God, that death is not the end of those who trust in you. And may our hearts be so composed in the Holy Spirit that all fear and bitterness may be swallowed up in the light and peace 
you give to your troubled children through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, who by the Holy Spirit minister to us in our weakness, and by the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ, have given the pledge of eternal life. Lift us, we pray, above our present distress and sorrow, and shed the light of your grace and glory upon us, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And amen. We are met in this solemn moment to commend Eugene Austin into the hands of the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who sent his Son to be our Redeemer, by whose stripes we are healed, and in whose name alone we have salvation. As we do so, let us then recall to mind the life of our dear sister, we do so through our hymns, we do so through our readings. And so we stand again as we sing the hymn, Heart, what a sound, and too divine for hearing. Congregation, kindly be seated as we turn our attention to the ministry of the word. <clears throat> Let us in humble trust hear the words of Holy Scripture, first recorded in the responsive reading, Psalm 121, led by Dwight Miller, followed by the epistle reading, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, Cecil Roach. And then we will stand for the reading from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 6 and 27, 
read by Simone Grant. You'll have the reading of the Psalms 121, and it'll be read responsively. I will lift my eyes up onto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be removed. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shield upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee for all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord, the Lord shall, shall preserve, preserve thy going out and, and thy coming in. From this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Epistle reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 13 to 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others, who, as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so, we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel according to John chapter 14, reading from verse 1 to verse 6 and verse 27. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me also. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you, there you may be also. And do you know the way to the place where I am going? Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, 
and do not let them be afraid. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise be to Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. I'm inviting the driver of P2481 kindly to move your car. There's someone who needs to leave urgently. P2481. Our worship continues as we sing together the hymn in preparation for the homily to be given by Reverend Arlette Waterman. We sing the hymn for all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confess. Thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia. <laughs>
Amen. Kindly be seated. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. First Thessalonians 4.13. Let us pray. Father in heaven, giver of life, we give you thanks this day for the life of one whom we knew and whom we love, one whom you knew and whom you love. We thank you, O oh God, for the life that you have given to her. We thank you, Lord, for the contribution that she has made, Lord, to your kingdom. We pray, God, now that as we give thanks to you, that those who participate in this thanksgiving service would pattern their lives after her, and that whenever you should come or call, we will all be ready to hear a well done, good and faithful servant. So God, open our ears and open our hearts for your word, so that these words from my lips and the meditation of our hearts all together may be acceptable in your sight, for indeed, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I extend condolence to the family of our dearly departed, Sister Austin, our Sister Jean. We do so to her children, Dawn, Charmaine, Angela, Jenny, her grand, Simone, her sons-in-laws, Leonard, Andrew, other relatives and friends. I pray God strengthens us all at this time as we mourn the loss of one whom indeed we knew and love. I remind the family of God's continued presence with you and that this church family here will continue to uplift you in prayer and that you may feel free to call upon us at any time. We thank God for her long life and her dedication to him and to his service. I would have met our sister years ago when we had a common minister, that is we meaning the Pains Bay congregation, where he was a member, the Bank Hall congregation and the White Hall congregation. We had one common minister of Reverend Miller, the late Reverend Miller, and he insisted that the three churches come together on every occasion, and he would say to you, there is a seat for every one of you. And at that time, all three churches were small churches. So I met her way back then. That would have been in the 80s. And I always recognized her presence in everything. She was a live wire in the church and attending all of the activities. And that's not only my view. I have got some views from our members our sister was an active member of this congregation, Whitehall congregation. And I believe even the word active is an understatement. She was overactive. And she was a Sunday school teacher, would have taught some of the ministers now within our circuit. She was a class leader, congregational steward, care fund steward, she was very instrumental in fundraising. And she raised much funds for this church, including the tea parties that she held at her house. She was a lover of nature, and especially flowers. And I'm told she was responsible for the initial, or is responsible for the initial planting of the plants around the church. She was active in decorating the church at harvest time and played a key role in the first flower show held in the old chapel and one later held in the celebration of our 150th 50th anniversary. 
and together she and her good friend, Sister Miller, look after those flower matters. And we have Sister Miller here, and I know that she's touched by that loss two Sundays ago. I was speaking to her, and I could feel the pain that she was going through from the loss of her friend. But we know that all is not lost. So we, I'm told too that she believed in standards and I knew that she respected protocols and her deportment was exemplary. And I've got to share this one with you because it's not often said between such relationships. And you can guess who said this one. She was an excellent mother-in-law. An excellent mother-in-law. We don't hear that too often, but... Brother Leonard made sure that we know that she was. So my friends, although it is an accept accepted fact that no one escapes death, the death of a loved one is never without pain. However, as people of faith, we claim Christ's victory over death as our victory. So today, as we mourn the death of our sister, we thank God that there is life beyond the grave. As we celebrate her life, we thank God that our sister died in the Lord. For of all the visits that we've made to her home to administer the sacrament, I do not believe that we've ever had a response like the last one the week before she passed. Yes, Sister Dawn? We saw her mouth moving to the words of the hymn. And on reflecting, we were thinking that perhaps she not only knew that she was going, but that she knew where she was going. And that is important for all of us that we know where we are going when we go. So as we celebrate her life, I share with you the words of Paul's to the Thessalonians, and this reading was chosen by the family. And these words do not only apply to those who are mourning at this time, but to those who will be mourning at some point in time. And here Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he advises them that they ought to be informed or to be knowledgeable about death. He writes firstly, but we do not know, want you to be uninformed, my sisters and brothers, about those who have died. That's verse 13a. And some versions of the Bible state, but we do not want you to be ignorant. In other words, the general understanding is if, that if you are uninformed, you are ignorant about death. And hence, you cannot be prepared for it when it happens. At the time of Paul's teaching, there seemed to have been many problems among the church where its members had entered the new faith and following Christ and they did not understand. And one such problem surrounded the people's understanding of the resurrection and life after death. So Paul is saying to the people, get to know what death is about. Get to understand so that you can prepare for death. And my friend says death is inevitable it is important that we understand it and therefore prepare for it. Yes, believers ought to understand the benefits of serving Jesus Christ and preparing for death. That serving Jesus Christ does not only benefit us in the here and now, but thereafter. So then, back then, and even now, person should understand that there is a resurrection when all those who die in Christ 
will be raised to be with Christ. And those who are alive in Christ will join them then. And that the others will hear, depart from me. I know you not. So let us not be ignorant. You see, my friends, ignorance about death can deprive us of many benefits, can deprive us of the hope that is available for all believers, can deprive us of the certainty and the confidence and the comfort that exists in that hope through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Ignorance about death can deprive us of the knowledge that if we live life pleasing to God, we too will rise and see our sister Austin. In Paul's days, death in the church was rampant, perhaps somewhat like today, but for a different reason. At the time, the church was being persecuted, and some believers were just dying and were even being martyred for their faith, killed because they followed Jesus. The Thessalonians could not grasp or understand or accept the possibility that some of their loved ones and the believers among them would die before Jesus' return. Having been taught by that said Paul to expect Jesus' return within their lifetime, Hence, the people were wondering what would happen to those who had gone on. Would their loved ones who had died miss out on the resurrection? Also, what would be the outcome of those who are alive when Christ returned? And these questions were to be addressed to bring comfort to the believers then and even today, where there still seems to be a lack of understanding among many persons about death, among persons both within and outside of the church. So the believers were not only doubtful of the status of the deceased members, but they were concerned about their own future. And I wonder how many of us today are like the Thessalonians, for today we are uncertain or concerned about our death. How many of us are uncertain about our destination? How many of us are afraid of the outcome of our lives and that of our loved ones, more so now with the corona pandemic? Perhaps some of us this morning are wondering what will happen to me when I'm gone? Are we? Haven't heard? So I say to you, in case you're wondering, that you have an opportunity this morning to dispel that uncertainty. For even this very moment, you can reverse that doubt. Jesus says in the gospel reading, do not let your hearts be troubled. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. Say, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places. So that is a promise made to us. And let us make use of this offer. Let us get to know or to be informed, my brothers and sisters, about death. Let us live a life in Jesus Christ by surrendering to him, giving our entire being to him, and then we do not have to wonder what will happen to us when we die. May I say that a life in Jesus Christ is the answer. And then you need not worry about death. So, brethren, we who live for Christ die in Christ. There is no need for us to be afraid or to grieve as those without hope. We thank God that our sister Austin understood death and the thereafter. She was not afraid to die. She knew that a life in Jesus Christ is the answer. 
She knew that in order to die in Christ, one had to live in Christ. So I say to the family and friends here, you need not worry. You need not worry. All that is required of you and of me is to live in Christ. And today, more than ever, we need to live in Christ. Every day we are faced with the news of death, whether sudden, tragic, natural death. There is always someone being gunned down or stabbed to death and more recently through the virus. We need to be prepared. We need to be informed about this life and death and its meaning so that we are not ignorant. And surely the Apostle Paul had that inkling that there was some uncertainty among those people. And so he responded to their concerns and he began by educating them. I reiterate that the advice that Paul gives is not only for the church at Thessalonica, that that advice is for each person sitting here today or listening on the YouTube. We need to know about and prepare for death. So here we learn this, that we are to be informed. And what should we do? Get to know, get that into that relationship with Jesus Christ. The second thing that Paul, or piece of advice that Paul gave to the church then and now, is about grieving. At verse 13, that said verse, the second section B, it states, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. Once believers understand death and the resurrection, once they get to know Jesus Christ, then their grieving is different. For those who believe the word of God and Paul's counsels, those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, grieving is different. We grieve with hope in Christ's return. And yes, we will experience sorrow and grief, but we will not suffer the same kind of grief that unbelievers suffer because we have hope in Christ for the crown of righteousness. So siblings here, as you grieve, remember your grieving is different because of the life that our sister lived and the hope she had in the resurrection. Remember, Paul is not saying that there will be no grieving because Jesus himself grieved. You remember that? At Lazarus' death, what did he say? What did the word say? John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. But Jesus wept even though he knew he was going to bring Lazarus back to life. So what Paul is saying to them and to us, there will be tears, there will be sorrow, but there's hope for a better tomorrow. And when we think that physically we will miss Sister Austin, we are saddened, but we are comforted by the thought that there's a better tomorrow and that since she has died in Christ, there is hope of the resurrection and eternal life. What Paul is saying is that grieving over those who die is one of optimism. It is one of rejoicing, one of hope. But remember, to truly experience this too, we must be in the Lord. And those who want to see our sister again, you have that option to make that step in Christ now, there's something for which to look forward, everlasting life. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying, no more death, no more COVID. So my friends, there's need for hope in Christ in this hopeless world. And then to, to further enlighten the believers he says, he gives a, a descriptive account of the afterlife occurrence 
which many term as the rapture. He says at verse 16 and 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself with a cry of command, with the archangels call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. What a satisfaction to know that our loved one will rise again and will be together with us. As the songwriter penned, forever with the Lord, amen, so let it be. Some persons will hope that such an occasion will be soon and very soon, but we must be prepared. So mourners, to be part of this process of meeting the Lord, they are prerequisites. According to verse 14, we must believe that Jesus died and rose again in order to share in that meeting. We must live for Christ, following the commands and the ordinances of God, being part of the fellowship, the body of Christ, and living in unity, and then we will be sure of meeting Christ and our sister Austin. Would you like to be there? Would you? Yes, so you know what you need to do. So that we can all echo at this time the words of that songwriter who said, Oh, I want to see him and to look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. We must start here now and believe that assurance that Jesus gives in the gospel reading, in my father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. He said, if it were not so, would I have told you I go to prepare a place? So that is assurance for us. And that way, we need not grieve as those without hope. My sisters and brothers, I say that death is inevitable. Believers not despair when a loved one dies in Christ because they are informed and have a relationship with Jesus. We need to better, we are able to better manage that grieving process as we look to the resurrection. As we say a temporary goodbye to our sister, this is a time for us to do an assessment of our own life since we are all going someday. It is time to prepare, I repeat. It is time to ask ourselves, am I ready to die? And where will I go when my life is over? I urge you not to leave this place today unless you have those doubts discarded. I urge you to stop and ask Jesus to speak to you now. Ask him to come into your heart. Come in today. Come in this moment. Come in to stay. Perhaps some of you are thinking that to attend church occasionally, and you're right with God, but attendance at church does not make you right. God expects you and me to give our time and our talent and our entire life to him. Making excuses about being busy will not be acceptable to God. Each day we turn on the radio, as I said earlier, open the newspaper, we do so in trepidation or fear, wondering what or who will it be next. We need to be informed. Don't be ignorant. And just as Paul comforted those Thessalonians, with the promise of the resurrection, we should be comforted today. Let us live in the hope of seeing our sister and rejoicing with her. Let us surrender our lives to God, saying, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. May our daily departed rest in peace and rise in Christ. 
Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we reflect upon the word. What is it saying to me? How can I use this word? What will I do at this moment and going forward so that I will be prepared to meet my Lord? Time is so short, so much is happening. We cannot afford to lose that time. Let's bow heads. God on my TV, close this message with hope. Hope in your promise, Lord, and faith in your ability to transform us. We are not overwhelmed by the loss, or we are not drowning in ho hopelessness, because we know our sister died in Christ. Nonetheless, we seek your strength now and the coming days to live for you. God, reach the hearts of those who are opening them to you at this moment so that their life would not be the same going forward. Any who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we ask now that you through your Holy Spirit may visit them, Lord. Do your thing afresh and new so that as they remember our sister, this will be a mark, a landmark, that they can say, I've accepted Jesus Christ from this day onward because I've recognized that I too need to be prepared. So as we say goodbye, God, to our loved one, we thank you for the gift of love. We thank you for the promise of eternal life. We ask that you will grant the family God strength as they mourn and courage to carry on and the desire to continue to follow Jesus Christ. God, hear my prayer which I offer on behalf of all of us whose heads are bowed and in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen and Amen. I now invite Reverend Rosalind Harper Johnson to lead us in the Apostles' Creed and the Prayer of Thanksgiving. I invite us all to stand for the saying of the Apostle Cree as we reflect on the faith in which we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Praise be to you, O God, our Father, who created us in your own image for eternal fellowship with you. Praise and thanksgiving to you, O Christ, our Lord and our God, who have overcome the sharpness of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers and are now seated at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. Praise and blessing be to you, O Holy Spirit, God our Comforter, who bears witness within us of our acceptance with the Father and have become the pledge of our eternal inheritance. 
on praise and glory, blessing and honor, thanksgiving and worship be to you, O blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. We bless your name for the life of our sister Jean, whom we today lay to rest. We give you thanks for the joy and the blessing her life has brought to others, for her service to her generation, according to your will and for every happy remembrance of her life. We bless you for your mercy and goodness, which have followed her all the days of her life. But now the trials of this world are over and death itself is past. Receive her into your perfect kingdom and bring us with all who have lived and served you faithfully to the fullness of your eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. I invite you now to sit as we receive the ministry from the Whitehall Methodist Choir.
during the singing of the hymn, I will sing the wondrous story. At the request of the family, we invite you to give a very nice offering for the building fund here at Whitehall. We thank you very much for your giving. We stand now as we join our voices together in the singing of the hymn, I will sing the wondrous story. gentlemen in the congregation and the gentlemen alone to sing this verse. We'll sing the chorus together and the next verse and the ladies will sing the verse just before the last verse and then we'll all join together. So the men. Sovereign God, we give you thanks today for your goodness and your grace to us. We thank you for the life of our sister, who through her very minister, ministry would have blessed the church here. And as we receive this offering, we pray, Lord God, that you will bless it, 
and that it may be used for the furtherance of your work here at White Hall. May we also continue to remember that, Lord, as we give our money, so we give ourselves, that you may be glorified and others uplift and edify. Bless this offering, we pray, for we ask it in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Kindly remain standing before I have the commendation. I want to acknowledge the presence of one of our superintendent ministers, the Reverend Adrian Odell, whom I believe was a product of Sister Austin's Sunday School. Mm -hmm. And so we acknowledge his presence with us. Let us prepare for the commendation. Eternal God, who've made us all and hate nothing that you have made and have given your son for our redemption, we commend our sister Eugene Lloyd to your perfect mercy and wisdom. Eternal rest grant unto her, and let perpetual light shine upon her. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead, lead us not, not into temptation, temptation but deliver us, us from evil. For, for thine is the kingdom, kingdom the power, and, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We bring our worship to a close <coughs> as we sing the hymn. Most fitting to God be the glory, great things he has done. <laughs>
Peter benediction. Now the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good thing to do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Can you remain in your positions until the choir and the body leaves the church? <laughs>